put on your Sunday clothes. There's lots of world out there. This intro scene for Wall-E is one of the most powerful Pixar animations. It says so much in only seconds. A future of widespread wind turbines, the failure of humans to be climate change. But relevant for this channel are the monuments made out of people's trash. <laughs> do they make sense? Could these really be that tall? And do we even have enough trash for all of these? So that's today's video. We're going to peer review Wall-E. Howdy folks. If you like what's going on here with the channel, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Before you're going in on the engineering, let's begin with a brief description. Based on the footage that lays the landscape of the post-apocalyptic world, we see how Wally, as part of his innate desire to recycle, scrap, and produce blocks of trash, has used his blocks to construct some serious works of engineering. Over the course of the barren earth era, he's managed to construct dozens, perhaps hundreds of megaliths that extend several hundred feet in the air, and generally resemble and maybe even eclipse the skyscrapers of modern cities. Even in their shape, Wally built a rectangular base that narrows to some degree as the towers rise towards their apex. Though thinking briefly about this type of architecture, while taking the silhouette of a building is probably more similar to the ziggurats of the ancient Mesopotamians. There is no interior space defined by the heaps of trash, and they just serve as a mimicry of the towers that do still seem to be standing in the defunct city. The vertical transportation system is a long ramp that traverses the exterior, allowing our robot friend to make his way up to work each day, which lends to the somewhat conic shape that many of the towers take, with each step up reducing the number of blocks at each level. Which brings us to the structural material of these towers, that of the waste block. Obviously, as structural members, these would be rather unique, given their properties would vary based on what Wally ingested recently. Based on the brownish hue of much of the material, we might assume that these are mostly a rusting steel or metal, though as we see in the movie that the aggregated material can contain metal cans, plastic junk, not fire extinguishers, and other materials. Now that we know that the blocks, and by extension the towers, primarily serve as a metaphorical tool that describe humanity's relationship to material and waste, but let's look at these structures, how they work and don't work, based on the physics. Cool, you may say, so why care about that? What's the big deal? It's a fantasy kids movie. Which, fair. It'd be silly to demand movies to conform to our natural world in every regard. Movies are fun and should stretch the limits of reality. That's creativity. That's wonder. But if a movie is going to use a key aspect of storytelling tools, character, plot, setting, etc. as a means of conveying something significant about our world, then it's probably worth exploring those grounding elements. Now that's the difference between hard and soft world building. Wally cares a lot about the reality of its setting and the logical rules that result from it, namely that the Earth's climate has become inhospitable and as a result humans have left the planet. And that would exemplify the hard world building concept well. In fact, most of the works of fiction that we'll review should probably be trying to engage with their world in a consistent or realistic way. So while Wally's use of setting seems to emphasize the concepts of material use and decay, let's start there. What materials are we using? What are so obviously, Wally's blocks are made from the waste that he picks up around the city. If the movie were to be rigidly concerned with the content of the waste blocks, then their makeup would at least be somewhat representative of the waste we produce, right? Let's dig into that. <laughs> Sure, the trash that the smelly truck picks up outside my house, or our municipal solid waste, is what we and the creators of Wally -E usually characterize as, as the content of American trash. Trademarked, I assume. And yes, that is the portion that we normie folk mostly engage with. There are industrial sources that we don't think of, and that's the waste from construction and demolition. So are we going to get into the numbers? <laughs> Gotta give the people what they want. Here is what the EPA has reported as America's yearly municipal waste and construction waste from 2018. We've got 292 million tons of municipal solid waste and about double that for construction materials. But when I watch this film, do I get the sense that the creators are intending to make a commentary on the construction and demolition waste? Not really. Often the trash shown on screen are just the kind of things that you might toss out with the rest of your food waste or just forget and leave behind when you move apartments. So for the time being, let's just look at the municipal waste. We've got about 20% food, 25% paper, 12% plastics, and 12% yard trimmings. Love that that has its own category. Then 6% wood, and less than 10% for each of rubber, glass, and metals. 
But if we recall that our film takes place 700 years after humans have left the Earth, we can give a healthy scratch to most of the organic material. Over 700 years of decay, we can assume that the paper has been reduced to dust, the food has run back into the earth, and the wood and yard trimmings are no more. Fair enough. So what would that leave us with? 35 million tons of plastic, 9 million tons of rubber, 26 million tons of metals, 12 million tons of glass, and about 20 million tons of miscellaneous stuff. And if the top Google search is right, the film supposes that the humans left the Earth in the 22nd century. Now we can extrapolate these numbers out over the next however many years, but that assumes the amount of waste we create of each type wouldn't change, even in relation to each other. But looking at the EPA data going back just a few decades, we've seen a significant drop off in the amount of paper waste that Americans have been producing. Which is why you're not reading this in a newspaper. All this to say, it's hard to make assumptions about what our waste trends might look like. Maybe we'll decide that we don't like plastic someday. Is that likely? Not anytime soon. Plastic waste has actually increased 14% since the year 2000. But please, leave your predictions about waste trends down in the comments. I think that's a really interesting conversation. So astute listeners, or even not astute listeners, may have come across some questions with regards to my approach, like, what about recycled material? Well, unsurprisingly, much of our waste goes to the landfill. Americans recycle metals at about a 25% rate, plastics at a 9% rate, and paper at almost 70. So technically, we do reduce the amount of metal in plastic reaching the landfill from our collective waste buckets, but the majority will be left for Wally's construction materials. But back to our investigation, how many towers could Wally in fact build? To make a few estimates on the size, the typical modern skyscraper would have a square base measuring 100 to 200 feet across, let's say 200 feet, give it a good base, and rise as high as what? 800 feet is quite tall, but as we can see in the clips, these things do seem to rise above the still standing towers. Taking an average weight of 150 pounds per cubic foot for the trash, which would be high for plastics and low for metals, each tower would weigh about 2.4 million tons. So, hypothetically, if Wally had scraped up all of America's trash from the year 2018, he could have made a few dozen of these. Even the waste from New York City alone could have made a couple of towers of trash in just one year. Another thought would be regarding the rate of rusting. Now, would 20 million tons of metals still be around in 700 years? Anyone who lives on the coast would probably tell you no, but their environment, one of high chlorides in the atmosphere, high moisture contents, even high winds are all going to exacerbate that effect. Wally's environment, while difficult to determine exactly, might fall under a standardized classification for corrosion, but with the arid climate in Wally's neighborhood, I think though that we would have most of our processed metals around. So what's the conclusion from this? The product of Wally's labor seems not only to have metaphorical basis in reality, but also a decent amount of physical basis as well. It seems that the trash production and recycling rates were to stay consistent over the next 80 years that Wally would have plenty of trash to work with in a city like New York to build his Mega Legos. But we're not done yet. So far we've focused on the materials, but not even as structural materials, just by sheer volume. Not only are Wally's blocks acting as a structural material, the way they're arranged is familiar. It would look at first glance that the towers of trash are similar to classic brick construction, trading in the clay-fired or cement-based materials for this non-homogeneous mixture of modern trash. But not quite. It, it doesn't have the binding material like a grout. From the movie, it looks like they're just stacked on top of each other. Not even any mechanical locking, like Legos, but more like a toddler's wooden blocks that just sit on top of one another. Which hypothetically could stack pretty high, right? Well, it's theoretically possible, but obviously in the real world, we learn from a very early age that stacking blocks eventually leads to toppling over. So why doesn't the theory work? Well, from what I can tell, there seems to be two main reasons. First is that the blocks will have minor inconsistencies in their flatness. The author of a physics stack exchange article derives a condition for stability and mentions that in their experiments they could get up to 20 to 30 blocks before it toppled, which corresponds to about a 2 to 3 degree angle. Is that a lot? I don't know. The last few seconds of this video has been rotated a few degrees. Did you notice? Another proposed rationale for the phenomena is due to uh, self-buckling? I think that's how it's pronounced. 
A joke, of course, we talked about that at length in the Corn's Tower video, but the key deviation here for Wally's blocks is that the self-buckling analysis is a contiguous material, which the blocks aren't. The Substack author checked what we should ideally be able to stack as uh, 400 wooden cubes, but experimentally saw that it can only go about 25 high. The difference in the stiffness isn't 1 16th, it's the cube of that, it's about 1 4,000th. Running the same analysis on a steel plastic hybrid block and ratioing similarly, we can't really expect the blocks to perform much better. All the while, you might be yelling at your screen that there is more than one column of blocks in each building. Well, I'm not convinced that there's much benefit to group action. If, as in Wally's case, most block columns are of similar height, then stability in one column will only impose a load on another similarly unstable column of blocks, and domino effect throughout the unlinked system without any ability to resist forces between the columns. Which brings me to the point that if the towers of trash are to stand as they're shown in Old Earth, the blocks must be interlocking. And that's just under their own weight, not to mention the <laughs> dust storms. So, after piecing this video together, I came across the Film Theory channel, which had analyzed these structures similarly, at least with regards to their trash content. So their conclusion is that they wouldn't have nearly as much trash as shown in the movie, stating that all of the produced trash could have been stored in a shallow grave the size of Delaware. And that's a fair critique, but I'm not sure the film states that literally all of the trash took up all of the space. Perhaps it's meant a bit more figuratively. Perhaps the statistics he uses uh, don't reflect the world that Wally's creators built. And there are other points that are more tangential to the study that we might agree or disagree on, but I'll have to leave that be. I mean, this isn't really meant to be a response video. I just thought it was worth mentioning. Anyways, after putting an unfortunate fraction of the amount of thought that the Pixar creators did when creating their iconic scenery, I'll leave you to ponder today's video, where we describe the quantity of trash shown in the movie is actually kind of based, even if the structural system has some questions. Anyways, thanks for hanging out. Adios.